Hello and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy folks. And we are thrilled to be joined by fellow editors and hosts of the Witching Hour Podcast, Haley Fouch. Hello. And Perry Nemiroff. Hi. Since it is almost Halloween and we're in the middle of spooky season, we decided to bring in our horror experts to talk about the horror genre in 2020, the state of the genre. And we were also going to talk about the scariest movies we've ever seen. So to, to kick things off, though, it's it's a weird year to talk about horror because there were big horror films this year that have been pushed back indefinitely. Uh, not indefinitely, but like we're not seeing Candyman until I think August 2021, which is a bummer. Um, and then like A24 just keeps silently pushing back saint maud which i really want to see Haley, you've seen saint maud right yeah. you're quoted on the poster i think oh yay for me <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome so they would quote that review because i said nothing but glowing things but yeah but so what kind of year i mean obviously i think the big horror film this year and obviously we have to go back to i think to february would be probably the invisible man um back in the before times but you know, what do you guys think, Haley and, and Perry, about sort of what what horror is doing right now, both like at, in terms of uh, where the genre is headed? Well, Invisible Man was definitely the biggest release of the year because it's one of the only movies that actually got a wide release. And it's also very, very good. I feel like if this year had gone down a normal path, we would still be talking about Invisible Man as a potential Oscar contender. I really do think that there would have been enough buzz for at least Elizabeth Moss's performance that would have kept that, you know, maybe not in the shoe-in uh, rankings there, but at least the maybe could crack the uh, nominee's uh, conversation. But now that things have changed, I feel like it's benefited so many streaming movies like, look at what happened with the platform. I feel like Swallow got a much bigger audience than it would have otherwise. We have his house coming up that I feel like people are going to be very focused on. So it is a bummer that we don't get Candyman this year. And especially A Quiet Place, too, because I think that was one of the only movies that I was lucky enough to see before it got pushed back. And like that just makes the ache hurt even more in a way. But... There's still so much other content out there to celebrate, and I feel like those films are getting more eyes on them than they would have otherwise, and that's that's not a half-bad consolation prize right now. Yeah, that's, that, that's where my head was at as well, which is that without most of our major releases, there have been so many opportunities. <laughs> for indie films or streaming, as you mentioned, or, you know, a lot of things that were put straight to PVOD that usually those are always there. Like there are so many horror movies every year, but people miss them because they're focusing on the saws and the, you know, why can't I think of another horror franchise? I'm so good at this. <laughs> there was supposed to be a new conference this year. The devil made me do Yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The crazy thing is, like, there's still so many of them, because I've been trying to keep up on all the horror movies that came out this year, and I have failed. Like, there are so many between all the streamers, and it makes sense, you know, we have Shudder in the game now, who's putting out so many original horror movies every month, and uh, Netflix has really leaned into genre as well, but it's, we're not hurting for horror, I guess, is my main statement. Like, we don't get to see... The Candyman's, hey, I thought of another one. Or, uh, you know, the devil made me do it. But we are certainly not hurting for scares during spooky season. I do think it's interesting, too, because as someone who, like, enjoys horror movies, but rarely, like, has the time or, like, bandwidth to, like, dig into the screaming movies, uh, I feel like I'm more aware of them now, like, this year. Because in pre especially recently, it feels like, and I could be completely off base, feel free to correct me, but it feels like with, like, with the success of, like, Get Out and It, and A Quiet Place, the studio started to kind of like blockbusterize horror. And so it was all about like, now here's A Quiet Place too. Even Us felt like, you know, a bigger budget, more kind of eventized. And that's kind of what the conversation was felt like gearing towards. I guess even The Conjuring 3, which is now a courtroom drama. Um, and that kind of just felt like they kind of sat right in along with all the other blockbusters. And it 
I don't know, at least as far as like this year was concerned, like I was looking forward to Candyman, but that also feels like another like big studio blockbuster push, whereas there was some sense of discovery with something like Get Out um, or even A Quiet Place, uh, kind of those smaller horror movies that you go and see and are blow, blown away by or something like The Witch. Um, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> well, I mean, to, to, to piggyback off of that, I feel like personally I've had more time to dig into like classic horror because like my time isn't so monopolized by you have to see the biggest, like I've still seen like a lot of 2020 movies this year, but I haven't like, I don't feel like I'm blockbuster chasing in the same way. So it gives me room to sort of like, like for instance, Criterion Channel this month had a whole lineup of seventies horror. And so like that gave me an opportunity to like watch early Cronenberg films. So like I, I saw Shivers, I saw Rabbit, like films I had never seen before and I had wanted to see. And so I feel like I was able to sort of fill in those gaps a little bit uh, in a way because I wasn't trying to be like, oh, I guess I have to see Spiral, the book of Saw. Hey, I was looking forward to Spiral. <laughs> it, one, of the, one of the cool things about all of this changing too is it gives us the opportunity to uh, not even just discover new uh, genre movies, but also new genre filmmakers. I think one of the biggest discoveries of 2020 is going to wind up being Rob Savage because what he did with Host is like next level inventiveness and it really just showed off his craft and his ability to craft a scare. And I think that's going to translate to bigger projects for him, especially well. And, you know, part of the part of the thrill of that movie was how it played into lockdown. But I also think he used that as an opportunity to show what he's capable of. And he scored a huge deal out of it. So I think we're going to come out of all of this seeing a whole crop of new harm filmmakers taking on, you know, whether it's a Blumhouse project or an even bigger budgeted project over at Warner Brothers and the Conjuring verse, whatever, like you name it. We're going to see a lot of new talent in the field. The dark universe. <laughs> a dark universe, if you will. <laughs> it's an interesting thing, too, on the, like, the new talent line of thinking is uh, the, the lack of blockbusters, just as much as the lack of normal film festival circuits, has almost democratized the process a little bit online. It's mm -hmm. like your movie's going to go either streaming or PVOD. If it's good, people are going to talk about it. That's that. You know, there are these online film festivals and they're, some of them are straight up amazing. Um, but it is a different thing and it's a bit less gatekeepy because it's online. So that means anybody in the geo-locked area who wants to buy a ticket can. You know, it, it changes the whole way that we're meeting new talent. It's yeah, making think... me think back to Sundance and in particular the conversation that I was semi a part of with Remy Weeks about how he was telling us about how the movie was acquired by Netflix. Because, you know, you bring your movie to a film festival like Sundance and you're keeping your fingers crossed maybe for a big theatrical release. And now it turns out all the folks who got picked up by streamers are in a much better situation and I think are going to get a lot more eyes on that movie. I am curious, though, about because uh, I think back to like Get Out, which premiered at Sundance, but not really at Sundance. It was like a secret screening. Um, but then I feel like was it like a month before it came out or what was the lag time there? I think uh, it was a month. It was a month because like Sundance was January and then Get Out was the release date was in February. Yeah. So you had that launching pad and it created a conversation. And then I think on the outside looking in, because I didn't see it at Sundance, it you got a little frustrated of people like outwardly like arguing like, but is it really horror? And it was like, can I see the movie first? Um, but that also really put a spotlight on some films. And again, as someone who's not as immersed in the horror genre, I do like that all of these stream movie movies are coming out this year, but I also feel very overwhelmed because people keep throwing out titles that are like, I think I've heard about that one, but I'm not sure what that one is. And now someone's talking about this one. Someone's talking about that one, as opposed to, you know, like one big midnight screening where you're seeing a flurry of reactions that kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what that movie is. Do you guys have any sense of like the success of these films? Do you think that that's helping them find the audience? Do you think that there's like a hindrance to that whole democratization of the process? Well, it, it changes the buzz cycle. That's for sure. Because what you talk about with get out, we saw that with hereditary, with the witch, with a quiet yeah. place, there are these early festival screenings that people like to argue about on Twitter and be ridiculous. <laughs> And it does generate this sort of uh, manufactured buzz around these movies. That's that's not happening. Like yeah. again, like I said, you can if you're in the geolocked area, you can watch it. There's the mystery 
is not really there anymore. So it, it, I do think maybe there's a drawback to that, but I do like that it's like if your movie's good, that's what's going to get people mm. to respond to it right now. I don't have any actual like metrics or data to prove whether or not certain things were successful, except for the interaction that we see on on Collider. And when you see the conversation that, you know, something like the platform or Vivarium sparked, that to me is a signal that there is a pretty significant amount of interest in those movies. Seven million households considered watching half a second of this movie. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe this whole video. situation will at least force some of the streamers to reveal legit data along the lines of what could have been on Box Office Mojo. <laughs> I don't know. I'm hoping. Didn't the platform wind up in as as Adam was wise, wisely jesting about? We can't really trust any of the numbers we're giving about this. But didn't the platform end up on one of Netflix's like top all time lists? I think it's so. Yeah. Very possible. We got a lot of traffic on it. I mean, that's how we kind of measure the success yeah. or failure of some of these streaming films. Is like, oh, a lot of people are clicking on this or searching this out, which kind of tells us people are watching it. And the platform was huge. And if they're getting the ending explained, we know they actually watched it. Yeah, we know they finished the movie. I don't really understand why anyone would release something theatrically at this point, though. Like, I know, for instance, Come Play is going to be in theaters. and Yeah, uh, that's weird. Why are they releasing Freaky in theaters? Like... I don't I mean, know what I, you guys are talking about, though, because Tenet saved movie theaters. <laughs> Christopher Nolan did it, you guys. <laughs> he did it. He saved movies. Everything right. is fine. And I, I believe the come the come play embargo is up at this point. <laughs> Actually, before I say anything, hold on <laughs> one quick second while I Google come play review. I, I haven't seen know. come play, but since I didn't agree to any embargo, okay. I will say it's a tour de force <laughs> and an edge no. of your seat thriller. I'm safe. There, there are some reviews out there. I think it's a fine movie, but one of the coolest qualities of that movie for me was the fact that, like, do you guys know what it's about? Lightly, at least. So it comes from a short film, Larry, which you could go watch online now, and it's a great short film. This is basically the idea of like a young kid needing a friend and a friend finds him through his his tablet and his phone, through his devices, and it's not the kind of friend you want to have. It's a creepy friend. So the idea of playing into tech and how attached we are to it and also speaking to something like, let's say, a host, where after I finished watching Host and then I hopped on a Zoom call with a bunch of friends, that movie sticks with me and gets in my head. The opportunity to release Come Play at home on devices and then have a better chance of the movie sticking with you after the fact? How do you not play into that? I think a lot of these have to be contractual, right? I mean, they, they can't be looking at a movie like Come Play with such a low profile and be going, our best course is to theaters where nobody <laughs> is. It has to be contrast. I really want to do like an interview with like the producers or the director of The Empty Man. And be like, how do you feel right now, champ? <laughs> <laughs> well, it does feel like a lot of films like that that like are getting like so I don't know about Empty Man, but like Come Play, where like the reviews are so so, and it feels very much like a studio is just kind of like rushing out a horror film to just put in theaters in October because traditionally people are like, oh, it's spooky season, I want to get out of my house, I'll see whatever. Like I don't really care about the reviews, I'll see whatever. And now are they stuck? Are they just gonna still throw it out there? Does it behoove them to hold it for next October? Feels like they're kind of dumping it. But I also feel like we're seeing a game of chicken being played, or maybe not a game of chicken, but like whenever like a new theatrical release date is announced, that seems like they're actually going to stick to it. It feels like the unspoken thing there is like, it'll be on demand two months later. Like we'll, we'll be putting it up on PBOD or something. Like you'll still get to watch it at home because they're not going to get that return on investment in theaters right now. It definitely feels like studios know when they have something and when they don't. Like, yeah. Like, if Candyman, if they weren't confident that Candyman was something, we would have seen Candyman by now, mm -hmm. in some fashion. Probably true. Yeah, because there is no, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, there is no buzzworthy horror title on POV, PVOD available to stream for Halloween weekend. Or is there? Craft Legacy. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Which I will stay right up. The Craft Legacy is not really a horror film. It's not, it's like, it's, it's not intended to be scary. It I don't think it a was. a spooky moment. It had a spooky <laughs> moment. <laughs> what is it? An exclusively spooky moment? 
<laughs> like the Beauty and the Beast thing. Yeah, I know. I mean, the original one wasn't super horror y either. I, I think it's more like social fears, psychological shit. And I, I, <laughs> and I just craft. had fun with the craft legacy. It's not like perfect, but I enjoyed it and I think it's fun Halloween watch. But you're well, right, it's not scary. Matt, are you as big of a Timmy fan as Haley and I? Timmy? Oh, yeah. yes. In, in the craft, yes. I mean, I want. I I wish there was a Timmy spinoff just to see what he's up to. <laughs> We're all on the same page about that. Yeah. There, there's the craft, and then you know his house is the big release over on Netflix this week, which isn't. You guys know how obsessed I am with that movie. It just doesn't necessarily feel like the appropriate play for someone who wants to watch a fun horror movie for the holiday. It's pretty serious. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very good though. <laughs> Imagine releasing Hereditary on Halloween weekend right before election day. <laughs> <laughs> kind of no. Bring the family. <laughs> hey, you know how cults are happening? Well, guess what? I feel like my parents are still my, mad at me for convincing them to watch Hereditary. Fair. <laughs> uh, um actually, you know, it's funny you do bring up her- hereditary because I do feel like we kind of need to talk a little bit about the A24 horror zone, which I think is sort of, I don't want to say it's becoming self-parody, but people on Twitter are being like, this is what an A24 horror movie looks like. And I was curious if you guys thought that they were, I don't want to say falling into a rut, but sort of like they've carved something out for themselves to the point where they can sort of be imitated. I mean, isn't that isn't that the thing everyone strives for, though, when you get like so good and so big at like one specific thing that people start to like pick on you and make fun of you? It's actually like a, a somewhat a sign of success. No, that they've carved out a brand there that's mar- that's somewhat iconic. I yeah. feel like I'll get worried about it when that brand stops working for me. But it yeah, has when the movies stop being good. Like, you know, you mentioned St. Maud and that movie freaking rules. Like they still have good stuff uh, that's about to come out. Um, and I will say I, I it's interesting like that it can be imitated, but I also think that's part of its strength. Like uh A twenty four aesthetic and the popularity of it is not a joke. It's on Instagram every day I see somebody posting something that's rooted in the A twenty four aesthetic, whether it's a piece of midsummer art or a hereditary shirt or you know they also make things that aren't directed by Ari Aster I can't remember <laughs> any of them right now but that's a fact uh but yeah even uh, Uncut Gems not horror but that had like a huge like f- not fashion but you know what I mean like a culture style element attached yeah to yeah it. people still are using like this is how I win and holy right. shit I'm gonna <laughs> yeah they're good like, they're, <laughs> those, those are pretty ubiquitous images they have very strong brand identity, which is something that I think people dig at. But I think it's very, uh, it's a good thing to have if you're a, a fairly small, well, I don't know how small they are anymore, um, but an independent studio that's not Warner Brothers or Disney or. Twitter. I don't see why they have to charge me $75 for a sweatshirt. That seems exorbitant. <laughs> but... Because people will pay. <laughs> that's the thing. It's that damn demand. Yeah. Ugh. Stop buying it, people. It's ridiculous, and I'm not going to pay it, so you have to stop paying it, because I want one, but I'm not spending that money. Stop. I was just looking at A24's catalog, and it's just crazy to me, like, how the year they were poised to have, and everything they got, like, they just they just decided to get out of Dodge. Like, they, what like, was, I mean... What were they supposed to have this year? Uh, G- Gawain, uh the, they were supposed to have the Green Knight, they were supposed to have Zola, um... Oh, yeah. Was you know, Minari supposed to get a release this year? Minari is supposed to be released it's this still, year. still, I think Minari is still coming out before the Oscar deadline. Is I think, yeah, but it's like early 2021. It Maybe January, yeah. Yeah, and then I guess, and then I guess they have their, they have a, is is Shirley A24 or is that? Shirley I mean, it was, Focus. It was Focus, okay. Because it ended up on Hulu and I didn't know if that was an A24 deal or not. Or, another no, one. it was Neon. That was, was it oh, Neon? Neon? Shirley was Neon. That's that was where I got confused. I think sure. It was like, an acquisition title at, uh, at Sundance, Sun- so somebody picked it up. It was independently produced. Yeah, that's that's a good one that has like a toe in genre. <laughs> yes. Something, yeah. whatever, whatever they do in that movie. That's it's something a little else. crazy. Not not necessarily genre, but the other one I'm very confused by right now is Focus's strategy. I feel like they've had quite a few movies this year that have just come and gone because they can't figure out how to really lean into the situation. Like, I, I, I think it's actually malpractice, the fact that they want to re- still release Promising Young Woman 
this year in theaters. I think that's I, not good. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. And it's not like I thought Kajillionaire was going to have the widest audience, but that should have been a little more well watched than it was. I feel like that was a blip on the radar and it was gone. Yeah. Um, but we're moving away from spooky season and getting into studio talk, and no one wants to hear that. You're <laughs> no talking one. about elevated horror, Matt. Elevated horror. Can we, by the way, just like, you know, shoot elevated horror in the head and dump it in a ditch somewhere? I want to treat elevate, the term elevated horror like they treat Michael Myers in the latest Halloween. It's, it's a trap. <laughs> just burn it. But then it always comes back to get it always comes back because <laughs> people just can't admit that they like horror. I just can't. Can you imagine if that if the term elevated was applied to any other genre? Like it's, it's like, ah, an elevated comedy, an elevated science fiction. Yeah, I think I said before, Wes Anderson makes elevated comedies. <laughs> <laughs> now you just made everyone sad. Adam. <laughs> that hurt my brain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So. I mean, yeah, I do want to, I kind of do want to touch on the fact that, like, I think, like, it's weird. I think as horror becomes, I don't want to say more mainstream, because it's always been mainstream, but a conversation of horror. I think it's kind of maybe time to, I think elevated horror was a term that people were hiding behind, but you can't, like, hide behind it when, like, you know, Get Out is making half a billion dollars, and, you know, it makes a billion dollars, and, like, you know, it's clear that this is a, there's an audience for this genre just as with any genre, I would say horror right now is way more successful than like comedy. Like comedy is in a dead place right now. Mm -hmm. Again, people are obsessed with trying to define horror. I don't get it. I will never get it. They just like won't. And this is where I think elevated horror comes from because to a lot of people, if it's not a slasher movie, it's not horror. If it's not a straight up ghost movie, it's not horror. And so they call it elevated horror well, and because they don't want to admit they like horror or whatever, but it, it's just a really goofy ass thing that I never, ever want to see on Twitter again, but it's probably <laughs> happening right now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> That's why I've gotten into the habit of just saying genre, especially yeah. when I'm talking about a movie I really like that I want people to see. Sometimes I'm genuinely afraid of saying, you know, this is a really good horror movie and alienating people who have a very small definition of horror in the process. Well, and horror is so personal. You know, I was talking, we were talking, I was talking with Adam about this the other week about how, like, I have a friend who is just deathly afraid of, um, like, the Blair Witch Project and, like, Paranormal Activity because of that sort of found footage aesthetic that presents something scary in a particular way. And then there are other people who just don't find that stuff scary at all. And it's not to say that one is right and one is wrong, but it's, it's two, it's two kinds of horror, you know, it'd be sort of like saying, like, all horror is scary. And it's like, well, no, it's scary to certain kinds of people. You know, like I personally, by the end of like Midsommar, I was like rolling my eyes. I was like, this is the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> Baloney. <laughs> Baloney. I'm sorry. I think Ari Aster is Nine a fucking times. clown. <laughs> I am obsessed with it. Yes. Almost I like really opinions like are different from person to person. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I was curious while we had you guys, though, because I think part and parcel with horror and with the boom, and I think, you know, it can't be said enough that it was a massive film. Um, it chapter two less. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in terms of just its impact on the industry and other studios being like, oh, we want that. We've seen a lot of Stephen King and stuff, but I wanted to get your guys' perspective on horror TV, because I think that that goes hand in hand with it. And, uh, you know. The Haunting of a Hill House is not the first horror TV show ever made, but it felt like this really big moment, um, followed up by Bly Manor. But of course, there's been stuff like the terror um, and things that I can't remember at this moment in time. I guess Castle Rock is technically horror. Um, but do you guys feel like horror TV is ramping up now? Do you guys feel like it's better now than it was before? Has the the kind of eventization of horror films and like franchise type things uh, been good or bad for horror tv or is it any different than it was before i think it is different but i think it's been different for like 10 years now um i think it was sort of the walking dead and american horror story that really changed audiences around and made them willing to watch horror at home in that way um I forgot the walking dead existed so that's <laughs> fair. <on me. laughs> fair uh in I was just writing about for our, our list of the scariest TV episodes. I was writing about this wonderful show. Um, oh, oh, you will remember the name Harper's Island. And uh, it 
excellent. And it came out a few months before The Walking Dead and American Horror Story. And nobody watched it. It got pushed to uh, another, maybe I think like Saturday, it was airing on a good weeknight. And then it got pushed to a weekend air date and then just quietly fizzled out. It was never like, it was canceled, but nobody cared. And it's awesome. It's so good. And if it had come out, I think like nine months later, it would have been a huge success. So I think in that way, in the, in the sense that audiences are really willing to receive horror programming, I think that has changed significantly. Yeah, there's definitely a big difference because I still like I think I still have like nightmares about covering American Horror Story for the site and having to stay up and watch the whole episode and then have to write the whole review and recap after and not go to bed until like two o'clock in the morning. And at the time, that was the only it was really the only horror property on TV that I was actively watching, except for for Walking Dead. But American Horror Story leans into it more than Walking Dead did. Walking Dead didn't scratch that same itch, but now it feels like, especially because I am so focused on the release calendar because of Witching Hour. I mean, just thinking about how many uh, horror shows we've covered on Witching Hour just proves that it's on the rise and it's continuing. And that's probably a a big reason why I'm not super sad about Sabrina being canceled, because I know there's more to come. And if every service out there isn't chasing the next haunting of for their own service, then what are they doing right now? <laughs> well, who has right. Castle Rock right there? I don't understand it. I really well, liked Castle Rock, and it feels like it's just going nowhere. It had two seasons, and they're just like, eh, nobody watched it. doesn't matter. Well, I mean, I would say, like, I was expecting really big things from Lovecraft Country. And, like, you know, regardless of what, you know, how people think it turned out, like, I don't really think it it hit the cultural zeitgeist in a way that I think HBO is expecting, given the talent on board and what it was exploring. And, you know, I, I feel like that show should have been bigger and it didn't really break out in the way that anyone was expecting. I wonder if it has something to do with just the overall shift towards binging shows instead. Mm-hmm. I mean, even though there's still there's still a lot of interest in Bly Manor right now, but there was something about being part of that collective excitement of the weekend it launched and hearing everybody's takes and seeing just like the whole property just go crazy on social media with so many people becoming obsessed with these characters. And I I feel like I know I have lost a little interest in in the week to week viewing experience. If you ask me what I prefer to do, I like binging shows. For, oh, I'm, I'm... And, for, and for whatever reason, I find that I retain the information on the shows that I've binged better than when I watch something week to week. And it's improving the viewing experience for me. All right. All right. I'm personally still a week to week guy. Like I'm the fact that like the Mandalorian is launching tomorrow week to week and I don't have to like watch eight episodes of the Mandalorian all weekend is kind of OK with me. I have a good example for you, actually. OK. I, th- I think that if Ratchet was a show that was. I don't know, on a TV network, wherever. And it was, it was on FX where Ryan Murphy used to live. And it was released <laughs> week to week. That show would have had big ratings for week one and then slowly would have fizzled away. But because people got the chance to watch it in one shot and then immediately interact with a whole season's worth of content on the internet, whether it's social media, reading articles on Collider, you name it, I feel like that just creates a different level of attachment that gives shows that are not so good like Ratchet more of a shot. All right, that's fair. I yeah, I think that it not being so good is a key factor there. And that, <laughs> I, obviously, you're not wrong. Like that binging is a powerful mode that that's why Netflix has become this cultural juggernaut. Uh, it's because mm-hmm. we binge all their stuff constantly. But I think there's room for both, and I think that the success of Watchmen proves that. You didn't watch Watchmen week to week, but it was a whole phenomenon. It was an experience. Yeah. Everybody was talking about it. There was room for that week to week success to take over the cultural conversation feels like that experience is fizzling out though it's like i'll never forget when uh game of thrones was winding down it was like like obviously watchmen filled that slot for hbo a little but it doesn't feel like we're having that conversation beyond that at this point i feel like the mandalorian will probably pick that up again like i'd actually counter with perry mason i think perry mason uh, i think hbo does it really well like people who have hbo know that on sunday night there's a new episode of some show and like just anecdotally like a lot of my friends who do not watch the same stuff that i watch were watching lovecraft country even though i knew that the ratings were huge and like no no one we know was really talking about it if i could have binged lovecraft country i would have watched the finale by now but i'm two episodes behind and i don't really care to catch up i'll probably watch it at some point 
But I, for me, just personally, like I'll binge something if I'm super into the story, like Hill House and Bly Manor. I tried to watch that week to week and I couldn't, but it makes things blur together for me. But having watched Watchmen week to week, I'm able to say like, oh, the Dr. Manhattan episode or the, you know, um, the Tim Blake Nelson episode. It's really hard for me to pick out because I'm really into like who wrote this episode, who directed it? What is that complete story they told? When I binge something, it just all kind of blurs together. Um, so, it's so I, but it, how different brains work. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, like, I cannot retain. I cannot tell you what happened. Like, I've watched Blinder twice now. And if you quiz me on, like, when did this happen, it'd be like somewhere in the middle, probably. I had to <laughs> ask Perry for help on this a couple times. I'm like, wait, what was episode four and what was five? Yeah. <laughs> the weird thing is, I can tell you episode to episode what went down in Blind Manor. <laughs> But Perry Mason had really high ratings. We had really great traffic on it week to week. People were watching that show week to week. But I think it just kind of depends on how you view things. Because I do think a lot of that younger generation are still, they're just, they don't have cable. They don't have HBO. They're not watching it week to week on HBO like some other people are. I also just think there are some shows that just don't fit the binging model. Like, I think if it's kind of trashy, then you can kind of keep going with it. But like, I've recently started watching uh, Succession with my wife. And like, we kind of just enjoy an episode a night. And it's like, this is fine dining. This is this is just <laughs> the right amount. I don't want to go overboard because also these characters are are horrible people and I don't want to spend more than an hour with them. Matt, can Honestly. I ask you a question? Yeah. Did you watch uh, The Vow week to week? And did you I watch, did watch The Vow week to week? And it's funny because you're like, oh, it all blurs together. I watched The Vow week to week and it still all blurs together because this is the most garbage show. <laughs> like the worst docuseries you could imagine <laughs> and i stuck with it for nine hours nine weeks of your I'm, life. A, I'm a fool yeah i am a fool. a fool <laughs> <laughs> i mean i feel like i need to like just put in like a clown wig and just stroll <laughs> off <laughs> hey matt um, was that closet behind you open before <laughs> I did also just notice that it had opened. <laughs> it's gonna be like in Ghost, where the demons pull uh, what's this Tony Goldwyn down. Um. Well, all right. Well, I guess let's shift gears a little bit and talk about like our what are the scariest movies you've you've ever seen. And uh, Perry, let's start with you. Stepmom. Okay. <laughs> I'm like kind of not kidding. I understand that. It, yeah. it, goes, that sense. it goes to what we've been talking about just in general about, you know, like personal taste and, and how you personally like to take in content. I, all the stuff that happens in the horror genre scares me a lot less than real world things that I know that could happen. But just sticking sticking with horror one of the movies that I put on and have vowed never, ever to watch again is Martyrs. Haley, Haley knows this. I think we've talked about it before. I, I think it's a pretty well done movie, but that was a third act that left me not just scared, but extremely upset after. And that DVD was tucked away and has not been opened since. And I, I genuinely can't recommend that movie to anyone because I don't want them to ever feel what you I felt after that. You recommended it to me. I watched Murders <laughs> on you and Evan's recommendation. I, I, no, there's no way that I There is. That. There was a, literally an article on the site. This. Was this when we were doing the the passing back and forth article thing? This is like a horror education. I'm like, you yeah, guys are I'm, horror experts. And I'm pretty sure that in, in I have to go back and look at it, but I'm pretty sure in whatever blurb I wrote for that, it, it probably says somewhere like, I can't recommend you watch this. And I'm sure I warned you. Perry is an emotional terrorist. <laughs> uh, okay, well, Haley, what about you? Um. So I, I I I agree in many ways with where Perry's coming from, which is I think that she's more disturbed by um, her emotions being disturbed by like than a sense of fear. So I too don't watch serious dramas that make you cry like Stepmom. That's that is to me like aggressively horrific manipulation of my <laughs> mental space. But I also I do like I do get scared at movies sometimes and. One of them would be Lake Mungo, which does both of those things. It gets right up in your feels and it scares the hell out of me. Uh, and I, I like 
still could probably cry thinking about the end of that movie. And I last watched it six years ago because no thank you to Spooky. Um, I love that movie. I can't recommend enough that if you want to be like unsettled, but also emotionally affected by a film, it's so good. I think it's free on Amazon Prime. Like that's how I watched it. It's, yeah. it's really good. And it's totally, I don't know, so low key. Uh, the on, director's only film, I think, which is dumb. We should fix that. Um, so that's a big one for me. Uh, a different type of fear, definitely. Like I, I was very affected by Hereditary, very affected by that film. But it's not the same type of fear. It's like my stomach felt like it was eating itself alive, and my jaw was on the floor, and everything just felt nasty and wrong. Uh, watching that, a, watching an Ari Aster film for me is like I don't know whether to laugh, cry, or vomit, or do yeah. all three at the same time. I'm I think sorry to derail laugh. this, but. Matt, I found the article. <laughs> Do you know what the, you know what the first line of my section is? What is it? The the prompt question is why did I select the film? And I wrote, I'm pretty sure I'm not the one who selected this film. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Evan's fault, basically. <laughs> Hi. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you another one though i actually genuinely think sinister is very very unsettling and yeah. it's probably one of very few modern horror movies that ever kept me up at night or made me think twice about something because you know how the uh the legend in that movie is that bagul uses uh images of himself as, as a portal between realms so I forget how I wound up with this, but I did some contest where I won a signed uh, Sinister poster, and I loved it, and I really wanted to hang it up. But seeing Bagul's likeness on the poster, like I, I stood there for a minute with with the poster in my hand, and I'm like, should I really hang? Yeah, I'll hang it up, and I still have it hung up in my apartment. But the fact that it made me think twice about that, I think, speaks to how truly scary that movie is. That one, that one messed me up pretty good. Uh, yeah. Especially those, uh, Bagul doesn't do anything for me, but those home videos are yeah. pretty nasty stuff. I'll also just throw out, like, I genuinely, my whole teenage friend group was wrecked by The Ring when that came out, mm -hmm. and I lost sleep over that. And a different thing, more in the psychological vein, is The Vanishing, the original one, not the American one. That's not okay. The original <laughs> one is not okay in a different way, and I'm not... I'm never like recovered from the ending of that film. I will never be okay about it. And you should watch it, but like, just you will feel bad. But it's amazing. Those are mine. My, my friend and I rented The Ring from Blockbuster, and it was like 1 a.m. and the movie finished, and it was a DVD, and like we let it like finish because we were like terrified. And then it ended, and it went to the DVD menu, which was just like shh, and the video going. And I was like, turn it off, Steve, get it, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> like, go, go, go. Because the room, there was no ice like in the room covered my tv with a sheet the night i came back from the theater i just was not here for that then we saw the ring too in the theater and just laughed and yeah. laughed <laughs> that movie's bad makes me jealous i feel like i like i missed the boat on the ring or maybe i watched it too late and i was already too i don't know into the genre and i had seen enough but for whatever reason that's that's like one of the big ones that doesn't do it for me <laughs> I think you do have to be like at a right age for horror to have its maximum effectiveness. Like, I think like the fact that I watched like The Shining and The Exorcist while I was still in high school, I think those had a bigger effect on me than if I had watched them now. Yeah, I was just the right age for The Ring to <laughs> very much upset me. I mean, I went with my best friend who's like always been my horror buddy. We were the horror girls, you know, uh, and. She saw it before me, and I got to the part, Katie in the closet, that incredible Rick Baker effect, and I was like, honestly, fuck this movie. I'm going to go. <laughs> and she was like, no, no, no. That's the scariest part. It's totally fine from here. And I still Ooh. have not forgiven her because <laughs> it's not fine from there. I love that effect so much. It's, so it's, and it's a PG-13 movie, too, which is even it's crazy. <laughs> but I just, I, man, there are times where you just you see something horrible, and my mind immediately just goes to <laughs> um, all hail I, gore for Becky. seriously i guess for me like i, I guess, didn't go oh well no one cares what you think <laughs> you said the ring <laughs> no i was just no. reiterating that okay go ahead adam go ahead uh well yeah the ring was scary uh i mean for me i'm more scared by horror that's realistic so like eighth grade we all rented the shining and i was never the same 
uh, just watching like a madman go crazy and try and kill his family was really upsetting. <laughs> um, uh, I thought you were going to say you were terrified of the movie Eighth Grade, and I'm like, I kind of uh, get it. <laughs> no, I was, <laughs> I was not terrified by Eighth Grade. <laughs> but I get it. Um, yeah, so The Shining was like the huge one for me, and it's a film that I still revisit a lot, but I still think is really upsetting. But it's why I was never like, I would watch... I would rent like the screen movies and I really liked those movies, but I would get a little creeped out, like freaked out by jumps. So I would just fast forward whenever it was like slow stuff. <laughs> and then I would wait for Ghostface to jump out and then I press play. Um, <laughs> but and so like it, it's more realistic stuff and like hereditary upset me. But more recently, I've only I haven't been able to watch it since was The Witch, which I went into at Sundance just reading the log line, thinking it was like a period piece, like just set in pilgrim times. Um, and there were literally portions of that movie where I was just staring at the floor, just like tapping my foot, waiting for the screen to do whatever it was going to do. So I didn't have to see what it was. But again, that realistic atmospheric horror that that really that really upsets me. I guess for me, like recently, and I've, I've told the story a couple of times, but like I was at Sundance and I had a block of time to fill and I didn't know what to see. And I looked at like the schedule and there's like there's a film called The Babadook. And I'm like, oh, that sounds funny. <laughs> what a funny <laughs> word. And I walked in and it fried every last one of my nerves. I watched The Babadook again last night. <laughs> um, but the movie that like I can't go back to that just scares the crap. Like it's just it's so upsetting. It's The Mist. Um, I feel like. Yeah, obviously, like, we all know, like, the ending, but even, like, the content of the movie in terms of, like, how quickly people will follow, like, a religious fanatic and, you know, how their fears will sort of create tribalism. I just feel like it's a very angry movie, um, but it still is very much about Frank Darabont's, like, all of it, most of his movies are about hope. And whereas, like, his, like, first three films, um, Green Mile, Shawshank, and Majestic are all about like the importance of retaining hope. Uh, the miss is what happens when you lose hope, <laughs> and, and uh, it gets bad. Um, so for me, the miss is the mist is, is is one of the most upsetting films I've seen. But beyond that, I feel like the films that I find horrific are like documentaries about social issues that I can't solve. Like I saw a film called The House I Live In about the prison industrial complex, and I just felt bad. <laughs> So, How did you feel after you saw 537 votes? I didn't. I didn't feel good. <laughs> didn't feel good about it. You feel calm. Relax. I was like, oh no. Really life. Yeah, documentaries are the things that I find most horrific these days. Yeah, because right? I can like I can walk into like I can look at Heredity and just like at the end of it go baloney. <laughs> like this, <laughs> I'm not scared of this. This is ridiculous. Uh, one of my go-to answers is always Jesus Camp for like movies that mm. genuinely scared me half to death. Um, and that I I didn't bring it up because I wasn't trying to be like cheeky and cutesy about it. But gen that movie scares the shit out. No, it's a, it's a, it's an unsettling film. Yeah, and I I grew up in like a super Baptist religious background, so I it just like gets in there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so uh, now I about, guess what about Dear Zachary? Anyone? <laughs> Oof, you want to have you a bad bastard. time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all going to go cry. Yeah. All right. Well, now that all of our listeners know what terrifies us, <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's wrap things up with recently watched. Um, Haley, what have you seen lately? Oh, man. It's, I'm still, I don't know what to pick. I've watched so many movies because I've been doing a lot of these uh, virtual film festivals. And I'm just going to go completely left field here and pick the Doorman, which is a diehard ripoff starring Ruby Rose that I saw at Nightstream Film Festival. And it is a hamburger helper version of Die Hard in that it is an approximation of actual thing that is still somehow so enjoyable for all its cheesy goofiness. Uh, and I just had a real blast with it. It's I will say his name wrong, and I apologize. It, Ryu Kitamura? Uh, Ryu Kitamura? I always like his movies more than I should. Always. Okay. This is like, uh, No One Lives. Did any of you ever I see I saw that? No One Lives and did not care for it. Yeah, it's awful. I love it. Like, I love it. I watch it a lot. <laughs> and I don't, all his movies just do this for me. I, I go objectively. This is not great, but I'm loving every second of it. And that was the doorman for me. And Ruby Rose actually kicked a lot of ash. She can do an action scene. I like it. It's fun. It's dumb and it's fun. Uh, Perry, what about you? Man, 
I, I'm like having a, embargo anxiety. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I want to name drop, but I'll just play it safe and I'll, I'll kind of waste this opportunity because I already brought it up. But in case you don't know what his house is, it comes out on Netflix on the 30th. It's an absolute must see. And in my interview with Remy, I think the title is something along the lines of meet the director behind one of the best horror movies of 2020 and wouldn't have written that if I didn't believe it. In case you don't know what it's about, it's about a couple that is seeking asylum in the UK, and it basically takes the haunted house genre and turns it on its head, because you know how in every haunted house movie you're sitting there and thinking, when things get creepy, like, just leave. This movie doesn't let them leave because that system is crap and unfair and terrible. So the fact that they're able to get into the horror of it and actually enlighten you on the reality of their situation is really something else. And mark my words, Remy Weeks is going to be something big. Cool. cool. I'll check uh, Adam, what about you? Uh, well, I attempted to spend the month of October catching up on horror films I had never seen uh, and didn't get very far. But I did see uh, the Invasion of the Body Snatchers 1978 version because um, I had seen the original, but I'd heard the 70s remake was really good. And it is very good. Uh, directed by Philip Kaufman, Donald Sutherland, Leonard Nimoy, Jeff Goldblum. Very young, very skinny Jeff Goldblum. Uh, looks like a child, makes me feel ancient. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's the same basic setup of the 50s film. Uh, you know, aliens come to Earth and start taking over bodies. But it's it's very much one of those 70s paranoia thrillers it, it kind of um triggers a lot of that paranoia that was going on at the time and i think the performances are really good i think donald donald sutherland is really good and the horror filmmaking is really good and i had seen the meme from the ending a million times and it was still super impactful for me at the very end of that film um and yeah <laughs> and it's it's on hbo max now uh i think um it's so on criterion channel for sure okay yeah so, uh, yeah, I saw that and really liked it. And I am choosing not to talk about A Nightmare on Elm Street, which I saw for the first time and didn't love. And I know Haley's going to murder me. The first one? That's my response when I disagree with someone. <laughs> the original one. Especially yeah. about movies online. I was hoping maybe you rewatch, you watched the uh, 2010 remake by mistake. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm going to watch, I'm going to give... Wait, no, it's not New Mutants. What's the, the third Dream Warriors? I'm going to give that one a shot because I told that one's really... I've been told that one's really good, and I've always wanted to see Wes Craven's new nightmare because I'm a huge fan of the Scream franchise. Um, but the Friday the 13th movies don't really do anything for me, and I wasn't, uh, I don't know, I, it was all right. But it's maybe because I'm Friday too... the 13th, the first one is way overrated. <laughs> it's fine, yeah. Mm, I don't even think it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty boring. I got strong. Harry Nemiroff hates that. Friday the 13th. The remake of Friday the 13th is fun. I actually like that. I actually like the remake. Yeah. Um, for me, I was going to talk about Mask of Red Death, Roger Corman's adaptation of the Edgar Allan Poe, which is awesome and it's on Shudder. But then I remembered I had seen, I had rewatched um, 1977's Hausa, the Japanese horror fantasy horror film, which is just delightfully bonkers. And I had seen it before, but I kind of went in with the mentality like, I'm going to make fun of it because it's goofy. And I'm like, that was the wrong way to go. It is genuinely like, it is so aggressively strange in all of its choices, but it works if you just get on its like very weird wavelength of like, what if like a really kooky, like haunted house movie? And it's like, it's very difficult to explain because like plotting wise, it's very simple. Like seven teenage girls go to the house of uh, one of their aunts and the house is haunted. But from there, it just gets weirder and weirder. And there's like a, there's a spooky cat that makes weird things happen. And it's just like, I can't even really describe house uh, that well, but it's on HBO max. I think it's on criteria channel and it's very weird, but very good. Uh, so I would recommend checking out Hausa. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. And again, big thanks to, to Haley and Perry for joining us. Um, and I want to give you all some space to plug the witching hour for, for Collider podcast listeners who may not be familiar with the show. Where do we start? <laughs> uh, so the Witching Hour is all about genre. Haley and I talk a lot <laughs> together, but we have like a real incredible lineup of guests. We have we have the one with Zoe Lister Jones who wrote and directed the Craft Legacy already up and running. The conversation with Remy Weeks goes up on Saturday the 31st, so Halloween day, and then 
on Friday the 30th, you're going to get a very special Halloween party episode of The Witching Hour where we got to just have some fun times celebrating activities and like drinks you could make with a whole bunch of friends like Vinny Mancuso, who came to that episode so freaking prepared. <laughs> like He gets a major applause to what he brought for what he brought to that episode. But check out all of our Witching Hour goodness. We have a lot of fun. Yes, yeah. please check out that show. Um, is, that if, like, is that like the Dick Clark's Rockin' New Year's Eve where you had to like pretend it was Halloween when you were recording before? A <laughs> little bit, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. I'm excited to watch that. Um, all right, well, if you want to keep up with uh, this podcast, you should follow us on Twitter. Uh, first off, uh, let's, let's start with our guest. Perry, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, you can find me at P. Nemiroff. And, and Haley, where can Oh, I'm oh. sorry. I just, I, oh, on I, your... think I just fe- like fell into the habit because we're always like, you can find me at P. Nemroff on Twitter and Instagram. I don't know uh, why. <laughs> I think it's just a habit to say that. <laughs> and Haley, where can people find you on Twitter? You can find me at Haley Fouch. And Adam, where are you on Twitter? At Adam Chipper. And you can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back with you next week.